Okay, so today we are going to go into our second talk uh, class, which is on creation. Where did the world come from? Now, like we discussed last week, we used our reason to come up with, to understand that God is rational and that the created world could not be here unless something that always existed preceded what we see. I mean, even scientists cannot explain certain things without this unmoved mover, this creator. And so we discussed the fact that being an atheist is irrational. And so let's just assume that you're all our God-believing Christians. Amen? And so now we're going to look at the Bible and look at creation and how to read it like a Catholic. And last class, we used certain tools. We talked about that we look at how it's been handed on from the beginning, which we call the tradition. Uh, we realize we have to understand the intention of the author when he's writing the book. The Holy Spirit, God, writes the scriptures, but he uses human instruments. And then finally, we have, remember, the magisterium, which is the Pope and the bishops in union that tell us what the scriptures mean. And remember, the reason that we're so disjointed as Christians is we have 53,000 different Christian denominations interpreting the scriptures in our own way. And there's only one way to interpret the, script, the scriptures, and that's how the church has always interpreted since the beginning. So let's look at, at creation. Why is creation important? Because we have to know there are certain questions that are always lingering in the back of our mind, whether you're a believer or not a believer. And the questions are right here. Where do we come from? Where are we going? What is our origin? What is our end? I mean, there are certain questions like, where do we come from? Why do I act the way I do? Were we always this way? Were people always kind of messed up? <laughs> or was that God's intention in the beginning? Or did something happen? And more importantly, why do we suffer? What happens when we die? Why do we die? Was that always how it was? That man died and got old? Well, realize that it wasn't always that way. That something happened. And because of that, we needed a Savior. So, if you would, uh, does everyone bring your Bibles? I didn't even bring mine. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, can I borrow your Bible, please? Thanks. And can you look on to someone who did bring your Bible? Which is like three people. Okay. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. All right. Now, everyone, Genesis, the word Genesis means what? The beginning. The Bible is broken up into two parts. The first part is the Old Testament, before Jesus. And the second half is the New Testament, after Jesus. And so we go to the book of Genesis, and we look at the beginning. The word Genesis means beginning. And we see in chapter 1, at the first words of sacred scripture, it says this. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form or shape, with darkness over the abyss and a mighty wind sweeping over the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay, and then we will go on, and God will go on to create the world, the plants, the water, fish, birds, animals, and ultimately the human person. Now, when we're reading the book of Genesis, we're not reading it to answer the questions how God made the earth and when he created the earth. The questions that are being answered when we read the book of Genesis is this. Who made the world and why did God make the world? Genesis is not to be read or understood as a scientific book. But we are to understand that God gave us this word to explain to us who made the world and why did he make the world. Okay, so the first thing we need to look at is it says in that scripture that God created. Now the word in Hebrew for create 
It, do you take notes or do you just kind of stare at me? Okay. Uh, grab a piece of paper or pen and take some notes. All right. Write down this word. I'm going to put it in the right hand corner. Bara. Okay. B A R A H. Okay. Bara. Now that Hebrew word means to create. There's a difference between making something and creating something. So let's say, for instance, this morning, when I wanted to have breakfast, now I didn't have time to do this, let's say I wanted to make an omelet. Would I just go down to the kitchen and say omelet, and boom, there it is. If that was the case, you'd probably call me up and use my services. <laughs> but what did I have to do? I had to go into the refrigerator, if I did, and I'd have to pot eggs, bacon, onions, salsa, of course, <laughs> all types of things. And I would have to take these ingredients and I would make an omelet. To create means, bara, the word means to make out of nothing. Only God can create, can make out of nothing. The word bara means that. We make things, God creates things. Okay, so that's the first lesson, is that God created the world. Now, if you want to know the Latin, it's in the catechism, ex nihilio, if you want to be a, you know, sort of a grad student, it means out of nothing. God makes ex nihilio. From nothing, he makes something. Only God can do that. Now, if we, look at, if we look at creation, it says that God made the world, everything we see, in how many days? Six. And on the seventh day, sacred scripture tells us that God, what? Rested. The Sabbath rest. We'll get to that later. But let's concentrate on what God made and then why he made. But we're really going to focus on man and woman. Now, day one, according to Genesis, God made light and darkness, day and night. Day one, day and night. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Day two, he arranged the water. He made water, the sea, rivers. Arrange the waters. Let there be water. And there was water. Day three, he made the dry land and vegetation, the plants, the trees. Day four, the sun and the moon and the stars. Day five, fish and the birds. Now I always wonder, why did he make fish and birds before he made cows? I don't know. I'll ask God later. But he made fish and birds. And then day six, God made the animals, the livestock, horses, elephants, rhinoceroses. And then ultimately, at the end of the day six, he saved the best for last and he made man. God made man. Created man out of nothing. Why? Well, Scripture tells us, first off, that he made us in his image and likeness. Now, you've heard that before, right? I think most people that have been, at least have internet, or know something about Christianity, have heard that phrase, that men and women are made in the image and likeness of God. But you know, these types of phrases, they're so thrown around that we never really ponder what that means. What does it mean that God made you and me in God's image 
and likeness. And how is man considered the greatest of all creation? Well, let's look at let's open your Bibles to Genesis chapter one, uh, verse twenty-six. I'll read. It, okay, if you don't have a Bible, just listen. Then God said, "Let us make." Human beings are our image after our own likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish, the sea, the birds of the air, the tame animals, and all the wild animals, and all the creatures that crawl on the earth. God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Okay. So let's look at lessons. And if, if I can, I'm going to erase this. I'm going to write these down. And we're going to look at the ways in which a human person is made in the image and likeness of God. Now, I want you to think about it this way. How are you different than a dog? Think hard. <laughs> Alright, in other words, if we're different than the animals, and we're the greatest of all creation, how do, are you different than a dog, or a horse, or a cow? Now, unfortunately, in today's society, there are some people who think we're just intelligent monkeys. And they probably work with these type of people. And St. Louis and Maria says this, if you think you're like a monkey, you'll act like a pig. <laughs> Alright? I'm just going to put that out there. If we don't understand our dignity and understand what we are as a human person, you will not act like a human person. You'll act like an animal. So you have to understand, what does it mean to be in the image and likeness of God? Number one, what do we know about God? And we'll talk about this a little bit more next class when we talk about the Trinity. We are like God because like Him, we are immortal. Now God always, always has existed and always will exist. But from the moment of your conception, from now on, you will always exist. Isn't that a scary thought? You will always exist. You're immortal. Once you're thought, you've always been in the thought of God, but in a time of history, God brought you into existence. And here's news for you. You will always exist. Now, that makes that question, where are we going, very important. Because we don't want to exist in pain and suffering for eternity. We want to exist in happiness. In the old catechism, the Baltimore Catechism, number question, I think, three, the question was, why did God make you? And I paraphrase. It says, God made me to know him, to love him, to serve him and to be happy with him forever in heaven. That's why God made you and me. Is God wanted, didn't need us, but God wanted you to share in his life and actually be happy and to experience perfect happiness with him forever. That was the purpose of your life. Now whether or not we attain that is up to us, but that's why God made you. So we're immortal. Now number two, we have what's called free will. Dogs do not have free will. I'll use an example. Let's say, for instance, um, this is just a crazy example. Communists were to come and take over the Plato, and they kidnap you, and they kidnap your dog. And they find two separate huts, and they put you in one hut, and the dog in another. And they starve you for three days. Three days later, the communists, remember this is all fake, they take you out of the huts, and in front of the hut is a bowl of Alpo dog food. Now the dog, obviously, is going to see that food and instinctively eat it, if he's like my German Shepherd that I grew up with. However, let's say the communist in English says, eat that alpo, you dog. Now, you might eat it because you're starving, but there might be a part that says, you know what? I ain't eating that alpo. And watch you delight in it. And you could actually restrain yourself from eating it because 
you believe you have a greater dignity. Do you see that? That's what free will is. And too many people don't believe we have free will today. That we're predetermined. We're base instinct. We can't, do, we can't do anything about it. Not true. If we really want something, we can do it to an extent. But we do have free will. Would you agree with that? That makes us in the image and likeness of God. Thirdly, we can choose to love. Now we say God is love and God made humans out of love to love. And only a human can love another and love God. Now I know animal lovers disagree with this and they say, my dog loves me. Okay, let's have that discussion elsewhere. But in terms of theology, and basic understanding of the distinctions between animals and humans, only a human person has what's called the capacity to love. Okay? You know, it's interesting. Um, I'll get to this later, but no, actually, I'll do it now. I read this article, it's kind of troubling. And it says this that two thirds, not about having pets, I love pets, but how people treat their pets. It says two-thirds of Americans live with an animal. All right, raise your hand if you have a dog or a pet or something. Okay, two-thirds. All right, just like statistics, you have an animal. But it says 90% of pet owners think of their dogs as members of the family. Okay, well, okay, it's part of the house, but is it really a member of the family? Okay, just ponder that for a second. All right, then, but it says this, <laughs> this is where it gets weird. 40% of married female dog owners reported they received more emotional support from their pet than from their husband and their kids. <laughs> Something's wrong there. <laughs> All right, now, and they say their dog loves them. Okay? Now, I think that person needs to see a psychologist, not necessarily, or maybe read Genesis, or maybe pray more. Okay, but do you see, I, the other day I was, I was, about a month ago, I was riding, coming back from a bike ride, and I saw this woman with a carriage, and I actually was thinking about stopping to bless the baby, and I'm riding past it, and I look in, and in the carriage is a dog! I'm like, what in the world? Have you seen this? Dog carriages? And not only that, they're dressed up like a little baby. I did not bless the dog. <laughs> Maybe I should have a charity. I had places to go, people to see. Not dogs. Alright. Now, thirdly, secondly, we learn. So first, we are like God because of these. Now, number two, this is sort of, we share this, but number two, Genesis teaches us that human life is sacred. It means holy. Human life is sacred. God made us for him himself. And he made the animals and everything else for us. The world is for us. But we were made for God. Now, whether you're old or young, healthy or sick, newly conceived, one arm, bald, fat, doesn't matter, you are sacred. Now, Father Sam has really cool anecdotes. He's the associate pastor here. And he told a story about a penny. He uses this anecdote of a penny. Have you heard this before? Okay, so he says, you ever walked around and you find a penny on the ground and you pick it up? He says, most times, especially it's been there for a long time, it's scuffed up, marked up, banged up. Maybe, who's on, Abraham Lincoln? Is on the penny, his spirit's a little bit mangled, and it doesn't look like a penny, but regardless, if you needed a penny at the gas station, it still has its value. And no matter what you do or have done, you've never lost your value in the eyes of God. 
because you're intrinsically good. Now maybe a person can't see that in themselves because it's been tarnished by life's events and sin. But isn't that amazing? In God's eyes, we never lose our value because we are intrinsically good. We do not believe that a person is intrinsically evil. We do believe the human person, as we will discuss later today, is wounded, but at the core, every human person is good because a person is made in the image and likeness of God. And that's why if you have a problem with people, you have to ask yourself, why? Is there something in myself that I find I don't have or have lost my sense of my own dignity? Right? Now, the Catechism says this, and write this down. Um, I don't have the number. If Bill, you can look it up. Of all visible creatures, only man is able to love his creator. You don't have to write the whole quote down. Just write, I'll give you the number. Only man is able to know and love his creator. He is the only creature on earth that God has willed for his own sake. He alone is called to share by knowledge and love his own God's life, and it's for this end he was created, and the fundamental reason for his dignity. Okay, now. Another, another point I want to make is this. <clears throat> that a human person um, is like God and has dignity because each person has a body and a soul. And the difference between our souls and an animal's soul, animals do have souls, that life-giving principle, is our souls, as I said, is immortal. A dog soul dies at death, ours goes on for eternity. And we know this, the church teaches us that the soul is created immediately by God. It's not produced by the parents. And we call, when a mommy and daddy make a baby, we call it pro-creation, creating with God. It's not just the human persons that make a baby, but God's involved with that process because at that moment, when that baby is conceived, God places in that baby a soul, an immortal soul. That's why all human life, from conception until death, is holy, sacred. You know, it's interesting. You ever watch it? It happened today. Um, I see. I saw this <laughs> bumper sticker. I always get. I love bumper stickers and I hate some. But remember, I, when I was in high school, I remember there was this. My my best friend. We used to carpool, and I go to his house, and um, his neighbor uh, had this. There was there was this uh, bumper sticker. Save the baby whales. Okay, and then right next to it, pro choice. So I'm thinking, okay, you're about saving Shamu, but you don't think that babies have the right to life. See the, the problem with that thinking? A human person has dignity. A whale is cool, but it's, a cre it's made for us. You see, so the point is, is we, that all human life is sacred. Now, the third lesson that we learn from Scripture is this. Not just about the human person, but we also learn about human work. That three, Genesis teaches us that work has value. Okay, now if we look at the book of Genesis, it says, God said to him, as he made them, he told the man when he filled the earth and subdued it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and all the living things that crawl on the earth. So God put us on the earth actually to cultivate and to make this world better. And he gave it to us. It says, I want you to work with this world. Now, the problem with work is this. We hate work. 
Well, I like work, but work is tough. And why is work tough? We'll get to that. Because something happened at the beginning. Something happened years ago because Adam and Eve used to work all day long and they could work and they could have fun doing it, but now something happened. We do not like work. We have to work. But the point of this is that work actually has value. That's why when someone's out of a job, they feel like they're lost. They don't have a purpose. Because essentially we were made to work. Now the punishment for sin was not work. What was the punishment of sin, as we'll get to in Genesis 3, that now we'll sweat with our work. It actually takes time and effort to work. You see? So now fourthly, did I do four? Okay, number four. Write this down. Man and woman were in the state of what's called original innocence. Or another way of saying it is justice. Now, in Genesis, there are two creation accounts. Read on your own. The second one, it says that when Adam and Eve were made, I'm going to read this, it says, the, the, the man and the wife were both naked, yet they felt no shame. What was lacking in these people? Sin. The idea of using another person wasn't there. Lust wasn't there. Anger wasn't there. Envy wasn't there. They felt no shame. Now, how many people in the world today walk around with shame? Almost everybody. Were we always like that? No. Something happened. Now, um, Adam and Eve had what's called preternatural gifts. Do you understand that word preternatural? It means prior to what we, before something happened, like they had these just, we would look at them as like superpowers. Okay? And Adam and Eve, when they were made, had the following qualities about them. All right, ready? Number one, we've already discussed this, they were immortal. That means that Adam and Eve, or us, let's say Adam and Eve never sinned, which we're going to get to, we would have lived forever. We would not get old, and we would live forever. Remember the song? No, I'm not going to do the song. Okay. All right. Immortal. Number two. Um, they also had what's called impassibility. Okay. Impassibility. If you look at passive, we, we get the word passion, means to suffer, is that they don't, they didn't, suffer. They would have never, and we would have never felt pain. Now you know how it is. You do a bike ride or do a hike, you feel pain for a while. Or you work hard, you feel pain. Or you get sick, you feel pain. It would have never existed. We were not, and there was no such thing as suffering and pain. Alright, thirdly, Adam and Eve also had what's called integrity. Okay. Throughout your day, do you have times where your mind's saying one thing and your body's saying something else? And you're trying, your mind's trying to tell your body what to do, but your body does something you don't want to do, or whatever. Or just an emotion or something like that. That means a lack of integrity. It's just something that everyone has. Back with Adam and Eve, guess what? The mind will tell the body what to do and the body will listen to it. Total integrity. That's how Adam and Eve were in the original innocence. Don't you wish that Eve never ate the, apple, the fruit? Darn it, Eve! You know, why didn't she just have ice cream? You know? All right. And finally, finally, Adam and Eve were free of ignorance and this big word, concupiscence. We'll get to this. I'll explain it. Sorry. Concupiscence. I don't know if you can read that, but... Alright. So, Adam and Eve had perfect intelligence. They didn't have to learn. God gave them knowledge. We wouldn't have had to go to school. Our minds were enlightened. 
And also, concupiscence means this, is that every human person, because of the fall, which we'll get to, has a strong inclination to sin more than doing the right thing. That's in every human person. And if I, if I send people to a psychologist and they don't believe in original sin, I don't send them to that psychologist because they're going to mess up my patient. Okay? A person has to, and Adam and Eve didn't have that. They were always in this state of paradise. Okay? All right, now, let's take a break here and talk a little bit about science and faith, and let's talk about the, the issue of evolution. Okay, remember last class we talked about the Big Bang Theory? And what did we realize? That Can we believe in the Big Bang Theory, yes or no? Okay, fine. But if we believe in the Big Bang Theory, we believe that God made the bang. Simply put. Now, around the 19th century, late 19th century, Darwin comes around. And he comes up with this theory that we kind of started like this, and over time, we walked straight. Okay? We were primates or monkeys or gorillas. Now, I hope we weren't gorillas, but there is some scientific evidence that might have been that way. So the question is, how do we look at evolution as a Catholic? Similar to how we look at the Big Bang Theory. Okay, now, uh, what is evolution? A process whereby organisms change with the passage, passage of time so that descendants differ from their ancestors. There's an evolution, evolving. Now, in 1950, Pope Pius XII came up with a document called Humana Generis. I remember that the Holy Father, in union with the Pope, they will come up with solutions for these questions because we need answers to these questions. And so the question is, well, the Bible says this, but what do you say? And this is what he said. I'm going to read this slowly, and then I'll explain the principles. The teaching authority of the church does not forbid that in conformity with the present state of human sciences and sacred theology, research and discussions take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution. In as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from pre-existent and living matter. But the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls were immediately created by God. So what does that mean? If there was evolution, and we did come from monkeys, there was a time where God changed the monkey into a man. God made man and put a soul, a rational soul, an immortal soul into that body. You see that? Now, I'd rather be made out of dirt. But, if you believe in evolution, there was a time that God made that happen. There are three things, if you believe in evolution, you must believe as a Catholic. Number one, that man, number one is this, man is superior to other animals because of our spiritual soul. Number two, woman came from the first man. And number three, only man can come from another man. Okay? The monkey didn't give birth to a man. There was a, the man was already existing, and God changed that man, or sorry, changed that whatever into a man. Clear? Questions on that? Okay, just want to put out there, because some people say, well, you know, your, your faith contradicts science. No. Once again, Darwinism is just a theory. Okay, but once again, but remember, the Bible doesn't say how it happened. It says who did it. Okay? All right, now, even John Paul II said, he, I quote him, he said, it looks like there's some good evidence for some sort of biological evolution. All right, now, um, before we get into the fall, I want to talk about another concept, is the existence of angels. All right, how many here believe in the devil? How many are not sure? Okay, 
Okay, good answer. <laughs> All right, you're on video tape. All right. So, I, I, angels and demons are a thing of faith. But we as Christians believe, and scriptures tell us, that there are these spiritual beings that God also made. And like man that fell, there are some angels that fell too. They went from good to evil. Because we know in scripture that everything that God makes is good, but then sometimes God creatures, creatures make themselves bad by what they do. All right. St. Augustine said this, when God said, let there be light, he created the angels. At that moment, that's in the first day. When God said, let there be light, he believes that's when angels were made. Now, a, the word angel is not what they are, it's what they do. The word angel means servants or messenger of God. That's what the word angel means. Now, an angel is a pure spirit created by God. And we believe that there were nine choirs of angels. That means there's nine different types of angels. The top and the most powerful of all the angels, and you can find these in the book of Isaiah, and I can give you a bunch of scripture quotes where we see lists of angels. St. Paul speaks about them, and many other sources of scripture tell us. The, the top and the most powerful are called seraphim. Okay, and then I'm going to go down. And the bottom, the last two, are called archangels and then angels. And we know the most about these last two. Archangels and angels. Because we see examples of them in the Bible. And actually, archangels, we know three by name. Michael, Raphael, and what's the third? Gabriel. Okay? All right, now, essentially, let's start with, um, let's start with sort of Lucifer and how the devil came about. Now, we're not sure what happened exactly, but tradition teaches us that when God made the angels, he put them to the test as there was also a test for the human man. And one of the theories is this, is that God told the angels that he would one day become a man. And Lucifer, who is the greatest of all the angels, felt that, why would I serve a God that would lower himself and become one of them? The humans. Now we think we're pretty hot stuff, but compared to angels, we're nothing. They have superior intellects. They can say, go to Korea, they go to Korea. They can move, think fast. They're amazing beings. And Lucifer sinned through pride. And so he said in so many words, I will not serve. And a third of the angels followed him. And it says in Revelation chapter 12 that a war broke out in heaven. You can look, Revelation chapter 12. A war broke out in heaven. And St. Michael went to war. He was one of the archangels. Went to war against these other demons and cast them into hell. And hell was made originally for the fallen angels. Where they would stay for eternity. Because unlike humans, when an angel makes a decision, it's final. Because their intellect is so superior than ours. Have you ever made a decision in like two seconds like, whoops, bad decision? Angels, when they make a decision, it's final. And so people say, well, could, wouldn't the angel like lose food? Hey, God, I'm sorry. I'll go to confession. No, that's not how angels work. Once they do something, they stick with it. He said, I'm not going to serve you, meant it. And so there is this fight, and, and the archangel Michael threw him into hell. And it says in Scripture that these nasty little big, or whatever, demons prowl around the world seeking to destroy souls. 
And if you look at some of the evil that happens in the world, how do you explain it without some kind of spiritual entity that's attacking humans? How do you explain some of the evil out there without some other force that's out there trying to create havoc in families and in individuals? Okay, so we're not sure how many demons are there. We're not sure how many angels are out there. Now, the word Satan or devil, uh, the church teaches that was first a good angel made by God. He was a seraphim, like we said, and it became evil by his own deep doing. The word devil comes from the Greek word diabolos. I'll write that out, diabolos. So a lot of our words come from the Greek. And the word, it's where we get the word diabolic. And it means an accuser, slanderer, or to tear apart, to rip apart, to divide. Okay? Uh, he's also called the ancient servant, tempter, accuser, and so forth. Now, um, but we also believe in good angels. Now, let's transition to, and we can go more about Archangel later, but let's just talk about the guardian angels. Okay? Now, at, at our birth, we believe that the lowest type of angels are called angels, and at our birth, God assigned an angel to every one of you when you were born to protect you and guide you. Okay? Now, in Scripture, we can see this I'll give you a, uh, a scripture verse for this. In Matthew chapter 18, our Lord will speak about children and, uh, if you give me a second, I'm going to turn to, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 18. Um, chapter 18, verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you, their angels in heaven always look upon the face of my heavenly Father. So Jesus Christ tells us that God has an angel that's looking out for us and also praying to God for us. Now, one of the best books, if you want a fun book to read, it's called Angels and Devils. And it's by John Carroll Cruz. Okay? Probably one of the best books I've read on angels. Ever. I actually wrote one book, so this is the only one. It's the best one I've ever read. Okay? But after reading this, you won't have to read anymore. Okay, now, in, in this, uh, I want to, I just want to uh, tell you what the, the guardian angels do. Because let's say, like, you're a parent, and you're worried about your kids. Pray to your guardian angels. Tell their guardian angels to watch them when they leave the house. Or pray to your own guardian angel. Okay? And it says this, that they, number one, guardian angels, they... They preserve us from any unknown dangers to soul and body. Have you ever had an experience where you had a near-death experience and something stopped you? Hmm. Could it have been your guardian angel? Right? I remember once when I was first ordained a priest. Um, I was living at home and I was really bored because I didn't have a parish yet. I was chomping at a bit to do, do something. So I got this call and my friend's like, I have a friend that lives in... Uh, like in Eastern Shore. Now I live in Silver Spring, and they need to talk to a priest. I'm like, I'm going. <laughs> I mean, it was like two hours away. So I had my brother drive me, and we're on Route 50. And I can't remember how this happened, but we're driving down Route 50 at about 75 miles an hour, and my brother just freaked out. And we did a 720 in the middle of Route 50. Like, <laughs> okay? And I, I was doing the act of contrition, and I thought, wow, I lasted one week as a priest. 
I think this is how it's going to end. I didn't even get to do more than like four confessions. That was lame, you know? And and it just, and then I don't know what happened, but like the traffic stopped and somehow we got to the side and my brother's fingernails were literally like clenching inside of the steering wheel. He was shaking so much. And I like, I think I, we both screamed. And I was like, how are we still alive? And I, I can attest that there were some guardian angels watching over me. Now I've had several incidents like that. And so they, they protect us. Number two, they defend us against temptations of evil spirits. Number three, they inspire us with holy thoughts and prompt us to deeds of virtue. Have you ever sort of, you know, you just I don't know where you get this suggestion to do something? Maybe it's your guardian angel. Remember the cartoons? You got like the good angel and the bad angel? Well, that stuff actually exists. It's not just a cartoon. Number three, they warn us of spiritual dangers. And they also admonish us when we sin. They kind of tell us, hey, you need to go see the priest for that one. Okay? They, they, were, they, they kind of guide us back to Jesus. Um, they unite us in prayer and offer our prayers to God. And they also defend us at the hour of death against anything that will keep us from going to heaven. Okay, you got a, you got a friend in high places called guard angels. <laughs> Start praying to them. Alright. So, a little bit about angels. Alright? If you want to learn more about angels and devils, get the book. Okay? Alright. Now, we're going to talk just finally about the fall of man and why we needed a savior. Turn with me to chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And this is called the fall of man. And this will explain uh, a lot of our major malfunctions. Okay. Genesis chapter 3 is the fall of man. And if you go to verse 1 of chapter 3, it says this. Now the snake was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord had made. Now the snake is a symbol of Satan. And he asked the woman, Did God really say... You should not eat from the, any of the trees in the garden. Ah, oh, come on. He's limiting you. You know, God really loved you. He let you eat everything. Why is it there's one tree you can't eat? Why can't you do it? Sound familiar? In other words, the devil always tempts us by saying that God is not our friend. And he's limiting us with all these rules, regulations. And that He's just a mean guy and keeping us down. He's a hater. <laughs> right? And then, so he's telling him, and then the woman, this is the problem, she starts talking back to the talking snake, to the devil. You don't talk back to the devil. You don't start dialoguing. And she says, well, I mean, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It's only of the fruit of the tree in the middle that where God said you shall not eat and touch it. But the snake said to the woman, you shall surely not die. That's not a sin. Everyone's doing it these days. God knows well when you eat of your eyes will be open. You will be like gods who know good and evil. You actually would be more human. And the woman saw that the tree was good and pleasing to the eyes. And the tree was desirable for gaining wisdom. And she took some of its fruit and ate it. Dang it. And then she gave it to the man, and we were cursed. It's called the fall of man. That's what's called the original sin. Write that down. Original sin. The first sin ever committed by man. Now you would think, oh, come on, all they did was eat an apple. But, once again, God told them, don't eat. You can have everything else. And that's the thing that gets me. They could have they had everything else. And they had to eat from that one dang tree. And immediately knew they were wrong. Because it says in scripture that they hid themselves. And they realized that they were naked. They hid themselves. And human persons, we still do that. We isolate ourselves and we did wrong. We don't want to talk about it. We had a silent treatment. We hold it in and hope no one saw it. Right? All right, now what happened? What was the consequences of this action? All right. 
What happened? Now, remember those preternatural gifts that we used to have, that we wish we had? They were all gone. So now, the mind was darkened. We now experience ignorance, a darkened intellect. We suffer what's called with stinking thinking. Do you agree with that? There's a lot of stinking thinking in the world. Where does it come from? Because of the wounds of original sin, our minds are darkened. Our intellect is a little foggy. We find it hard sometimes to discern good and evil. Sometimes we can't even make simple decisions because our minds just can't focus. Where do you think ADD came from? <laughs> attention de everyone has attention deficit disorder, you know? Everyone. No, it's from original sin. Just pay attention. Now, some people, yes. Some more than others. Now we experience suffering. God told the woman that now you experience pain from childbearing. Labor pains came because Eve ate the apple or the fruit. Now, actually, for the record, we're not sure if it was an apple. It's always depicted as an apple, but it never says apple. Actually, we'll find out later, it possibly was a fig. Why? Because in the New Testament, the Lord curses the fig tree. Why would he curse a tree? It's basically because of you. I have to die on the cross. And, he, and it's a really funny scene where the Lord just has, he's just like, yeah. And he like curses the tree and it just withers off. Remember this? All right, the Bible's great. Read it, okay? Take your Bible and blow it off and read it. You know, first miracle, John chapter 2. You're going to know these things. You will. The end of this class, you'll know these things. If you go to Mass, by the way, you'll learn these stories, okay? It's, it's, it's Christ doing wonderful things. Now there is suffering. And then, now, death enters the scene. You know, this week, I mean... I'm like, hey, there have been so many deaths in the parish. It was like, I, four phone calls. Boom, 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 boom. Four funerals. And now, I don't know if you know, Lori Sanchez, 35 years old, died of cancer. Right? Three kids. Right? That didn't exist. Death didn't exist. It's, a, it's an evil. It's a physical evil. And why? Because of the effects of original sin. Death came into the world. And now, now, we are inclined to sin. We find it very hard to fight temptation. We find it very hard to just be virtuous and to smile when we're grumpy. We find it very hard to work hard and to just pay attention in, in Father Swing's class. All these things are difficult. Why? Because of original sin. And everyone in the world struggles with this. And so God needed to send us a savior to free us from this curse the curse of sin and death and suffering and his name is very good you're very excited jesus christ <laughs> sound like redskin fans two weeks ago <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. all right all right so so let's go to this promise, and this will be a great way to end the class, okay? Open your books to Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. And, and God speaks first to the man, and then he talks to the devil, and then he speaks to the woman. Well, let's see what he says to the man. He starts with Adam. Now, the problem with Adam, Adam was supposed to be protecting his wife and guarding her. But he was all fishing. While there's this dragon attacking his wife. And the unfortunate it's happening in many marriages today. And the, the wife's trying to raise the kids and teach them about God. And the, the man just kind of got his little hobbies and he's doing all these different things, but he's not leading the family and guarding the wife and the children. 
from all kinds of attacks. A lack of fatherhood. And so God first goes to the man because the man should have been guarding his wife, Eve, and protecting her. Scott Hahn says that. He says, where is the man? How come he let this serpent seduce his wife? And so he says to the man, where are you? And the answer, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Bad answer. Then God asked, who told you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I have forbidden you to eat? And notice what the man says. He's such a wimp. <laughs> right? He says this. The woman you put me here with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. He couldn't even, he couldn't even like own up to the fact that he ate the apple. He put the blame on his wife. If you haven't given that woman, I wouldn't have done it. You know, a lot of times, isn't it true that we sort of blame our failures on everyone else? Ah, oh, gee, things were different. I wouldn't do that sin. No, look at all these things they have in society today. If they do change, then I'd be holy. Ah, oh, come on. Remember, we have free will. At the end of the day, it's God's not going to ask whatever else is doing. He says, what did you do? And so then, God speaks to the devil, the snake, and he says, because you have done this, cursed are you among all the animals, time, tame or wild. That's why like, Indiana Jones hates snakes, right? On your belly you shall crawl, and dust you, you shall eat all the days of your life, and I will, now listen to this, this is important, on verse 15, chapter 3, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He promises that there would a woman would come that would break the curse. Not a man, a woman initially to allow the man to break the curse. Now, we'll know later that this woman will be Mary. Now, if you look at Catholic statues of Mary, Mary is always stepping on a snake. Huh. Why? We'll get to that later when we talk about Mary. She broke the curse by saying, as Eve said no to God's will, Mary will say, yes, I will be the mother of God and I will allow Jesus Christ, the Savior of to come and be conceived in me to save the world. Right? And then he says to the woman, I will intensify your toil and childbearing. No, hold on. Let's go back to the snake. He says, and between offspring and hers, they will strike at your head while you strike at their heel. Mm. So he promises, that's called the proto-evangelium, the first gospel. He promises the devil that someday he would be destroyed. From the seed of the woman, that would be Jesus Christ. And as the fall of man happened because of a tree, our salvation will also years later happen on a tree. And we call that tree what? The cross. Interesting. Do you see how God undoes the curse with a new Eve and a new Adam? Mary. And Jesus. See? And so next time what we'll talk about is the Trinity. Now I'm going to warn you. It is going to be one of those classes you will need a big cup of coffee. If you can't get a good night's sleep prior to the class. Because the Trinity is the most difficult mystery to speak about. And we speak about God himself. But hopefully, next class, we're just going to talk about how we understand God as being three persons in one God. Okay? And what does it teach us about our faith? And it is the central mystery because it's God himself. Once we get through that, then we're going to move on to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to go into the church. How do we know 
the church that you are attempting to enter is the church that Jesus started. Okay? All right. Class over. Questions?